Good morning and welcome to the First Congregational United Church of Christ in Ashland, Oregon. I will be your host this morning, your facilitator. I am uh, Fred Gruy. So welcome. Glad you're here. Peace with you, whoever you are, wherever you are. On this uh, journey of life, we want you to know that you are loved by God. We'll work at loving you and work at loving each other. We are delighted that you are here and you are welcome in this space, no matter who you are, where you are. And it is our hope that uh, this morning we will be connected in God's spirit and we gather here for connection, not for perfection, as we follow Jesus on the way of radical love. So thank you for being here and bringing your whole self just as you are. Welcome. Please join me for the call to worship. Get wisdom, get understanding, 
Do not forget my words or turn away from them. Do not forsake wisdom and she will protect you. Love her and she will watch over you. The beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom, though it costs all you have. Get understanding, cherish her and she will exalt you. Embrace her and she will honor you. She will give you a garland to grace your head and present you with a glorious crown. Okay, please join us as we sing number 286, Spirit, Spirit of Gentleness.
Good morning. Our reading this morning is from 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 3 through 15. And Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of his father David, except that he sacrificed and burned incense at the high places. Now the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask, what shall I give you? And Solomon said, you have shown great mercy to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in truth, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart with you. You have continued this great kindness for him, and you have given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. Now, O oh Lord, my God, you have made your servant king instead of my father, David. But I am a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people too numerous to be numbered or counted. Therefore, give to your servant an understanding heart to judge your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? The speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. Then God said to him, because you have asked this thing and have not asked a long life for yourself, nor have asked riches for yourself, nor have asked the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern justice. Behold, I have done according to your words. See, I have given you a wise and understanding heart so that there has not been anyone like you before you, nor shall any like you arise after you. And I have also given you what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be anyone like you among the kings all your days. So if you walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. Then Solomon awoke, and indeed it had been a dream. And he came to Jerusalem and stood before the ark of the covenant of the Lord, offered up burnt offerings, offered peace offerings, and made a feast for all his servants. I can tell by the way I'll let you alone and I'll let you walk on in your own good time you'll be back where the sun can find you under the wise wishing tree and with all of them will lie under the shade The past isn't letting you go, but there's only so long you can take it all on, and the wrong's gotta be on its own. And when you're ready to leave it behind you, you'll look back and all that you'll see is a wreckage and rust that you left in. Yeah. 
Let us pray. O oh, Holy One, you who had the ability to even uh, cause the prophet Balaam's donkey to communicate important information, may you even anoint me this morning to communicate uh, to my sisters, my brothers, my siblings, some words that could help us all uh, become more the the human beings and the, and the community of faith that you dream us to be. God, we ask your blessing on the words of my mouth and the hearing of our ears and the openness of our heart to receive your spirit this morning. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So in the text that uh, Lori read to us this morning, the Obvious focus here will be on wisdom. And if you have been uh, following for the last couple of weeks, this is the third in a series of three uh, reflections on uh, what I think are important aspects or characteristics for us as we endeavor to follow Jesus on the path of radical love. Uh, and so the first week I shared that one of our major priorities would be to create as a faith community, as a church, a, a sanctuary, if you will, of reconciliation. And uh, that that is one of the primary purposes of a church is to be a place of reconciliation where we help folks reconcile with God, with each other, with ourselves and with all of creation. 
And last week I introduced the uh, idea that this work of reconciliation that we should be about should, or I would say must, be marinated with compassion. If, if, if what we're doing is not compassionate, it is counterproductive or uh, void at best. And this week I would like to add the seasoning. So we're going to marinate reconciliation with compassion. And this morning I would like to uh, season this work of reconciliation with this concept of wisdom. So that is why I selected the text that Lori read to us a few moments ago from uh, the book of Kings about Solomon asking for wisdom. Now, Solomon, uh, we are told, uh, it's believed, was in his early 20s when he became king of Israel. And he was replacing a legend. His father, David, was the greatest king in the history of Israel. In fact, Israel grew to the most prominent place in its entire history under David's reign. It had more territory. It had more influence and more power and more wealth than anybody before David. And so young Solomon is replacing a legend. Now, replacing a legend is always hard. I mean, it is fraught with uh, really a no-win situation. I mean, can you remember uh, who replaced John Wooden as the basketball coach at UCLA? Thankless job. Or who replaced uh, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King at Ebenezer Baptist Church? Or who replaced Diana Ross in the Supremes or, or Bill Murray on Saturday Night Live? I mean, you just replacing a legend is, is so hard. And that's what Solomon was tasked with. But Solomon had the brilliant idea that he, he recognized that David's great source of power and, and strength and wisdom and grace came from David's relationship with God. And so Solomon, who the Bible says was the wisest man that ever lived, uh, he put that wisdom to work. And so at the very beginning of his reign, he put on the most elaborate worship service, I think, recorded in the Bible. And he went before the Ark of the Covenant and, and prayed to this God and said, God, I need, uh, I need help if I'm going to govern your people. And so God said, well, what would you like? Now, can you imagine being in your 20s? And God says to you, ask me whatever you want. I'll give it to you. <laughs> what a terrifying what a terrifying prospect that would be for the rest of humanity to have that kind of uh, cachet with the divine holy one. Give me whatever I want. And Solomon asked for wisdom. Give me an understanding heart, it says in this text, uh, that I might steer and serve and, and guide and protect with, with justice and compassion your people. Helen Luke, uh, 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 an author that writes a lot about Dante and Dante's uh, the, the Commedia, points out that Solomon is not asking here for head knowledge. The kind of wisdom that Solomon is asking for is heart knowledge infused with compassion. That's the kind of wisdom we're talking about here, a, a compassionate wisdom. So, and God is so pleased with Solomon's request that God gives Solomon a bunch of other stuff as well. That's the idea for another sermon or, or reflection. But I'd like to focus here on what is this kind of wisdom, this understanding heart, this kind of a wisdom? Well, in trying to describe what that's like, I was reminded of Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart's reply Back in 1964, I don't know if you remember the case of uh, Jacob Ellis versus Ohio. It was a case about pornography. And Justice Potter Stewart said in, 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 the, uh, in that Supreme Court decision, well, I, I know it when I see it. <laughs> and I think that's much like wisdom. It's hard to describe, but you sort of know it when you see it. And compassionate wisdom eludes definition 
because it's just hard to codify. I mean, what could be compassionate wisdom in one situation could be very oppressive in another situation. I mean, look at the issues that we face so uh, strikingly in our own culture right now, the issues of abortion, the issues of uh, immigration, particularly at our southern border. What might be compassionate wisdom in one case could be oppressive in another. And so how do you, uh, there's just something, it just, it doesn't, it's not a one size fit all thing. It, it just doesn't work for every possible uh, potentiality that might arise. However, as I think about the wise people that I respect in my own life, as I, as, as I try to think, well, what is it about them that makes them wise? There's four things I would suggest uh, for your consideration this morning. And so here's my criteria of what helps or, or how, what I admire in a wise person. Number one, they seem to be able to make friends with solitude. They live lives in service of others. They, ha they have a, an ability to see through the complexity of a situation and they're humble. So those are my four criteria of what makes a person wise. And so let me just take a moment to unpack each of those for us. When it comes to solitude, I'm not talking about just being alone or wanting to be alone. Uh, there's some people that are alone. I'm glad they are because <laughs> they're no fun to be around. But I think solitude can be fertile soil for a development of wisdom. And uh, because it causes, it, it can cause us to think, who am I? What am I doing? Why am I here? Why do I behave the way I do? Uh, the great Chinese master, the Taoist master Lao Tzu in the Tao Te Chung says to understand others is to be knowledgeable. To understand yourself is to be wise. And I think uh, it can be a scary prospect, some of this inward reflection or contemplation, as I've uh, shared at other times, as I shared last week, uh, it can be scary looking in because you don't know what you're going to find or what you find you might not like all that much. And so we tend to occupy much of our time with distractions. And I love that line from the four quartets by T.S. Eliot, where he says, we are distracted from distraction by distractions. But if we're going to enter into solitude, we need to put the distraction, put the news aside, put the games aside, put all, whatever it is, all that noise we use to fill up our life, we need to put that aside and really look deeply into my life, exploring who I am. What am I doing? Why do I do what I do? These are deep questions that help us grow in wisdom. Now, as I say, some people call this contemplation or meditation. Uh, what you call it, I don't care. It's just, I think, important that we take some time to do it. When someone who has plumbed their own depth speaks, they're a voice and not an echo. And their words not only tease our minds, but they pierce our souls. Now, another aspect of wisdom. So that's solitude. Another aspect is that it is used for the benefit of others. Lao Tzu again and the Tao Te Chung. The sage accumulates nothing, having used what he or she has for others, he or she has even more. The way of the human is to act on the behalf of others and not to compete with them. And I think this is exactly what Solomon was asking for in the text, the kind of compassionate wisdom to serve people under his care. And similarly, our rabbi, the one we're trying to follow, Jesus, famously said in Matthew 20, 28, the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life for others. Now, the third aspect I talked about this seeing through the complexity of things by seeing through, I mean, the kind of wisdom 
that simply avoids presenting one side of a complex issue. Whenever I hear someone speaking or talking and they're only presenting one side of the issue, I tune them right out because I just find that not profitable at all. Or similarly, if they do try to present the other side of an issue, they may do it with such extreme examples. It's in philosophy, it's called the straw man principle, where you, you present an example that's so absurd, nobody could ever agree, with, but that's not fair. I mean, there are intelligent, compassionate, wise people on the other side of almost every issue. And to discount them and not listen to their voice is, I think, silly. The wonderful Buddhist teacher Thich Nhat Hanh says, every view is the wrong view if it is presented as the only view. And so wise teachers have an ability to see various sides of these complex issues, such as abortion, immigration, uh, inflation, our standing in the world, uh, the, uh, the care of the environment. And they're able to discern the merits of competing arguments. And these kinds of folks are very comfortable with something that frustrates many of us. They're comfortable with paradox, holding what seems to be two opposite things at the same time, and, and, and to realize that they color and give depth and wisdom to our actions. They avoid black and white thinking, and they're not argumentative folks. They seem to trust in the power of wisdom to be e heeded by those who have ears to hear, as Jesus said. And so these kind of folks are marked with humility. They don't scream and yell. They don't try to force you into agreeing with their position. They're not elitist. They're not, oh, I'm so much better than everybody else. There's a humility about them that... Uh, is endearing and inviting into what they have to say. Cahil Gibran in the prophet says, if he or she, the teacher, is indeed wise, he or she will not bid you to enter the house of their wisdom, but rather lead you into the threshold of your own mind. And so that's to me, a very important aspect of wise people. They don't try to coerce you or strongly convince you that they're right. So the question, I think the more important question, how do we become wise? I mean, all right, if whether you agree with my criteria or you want to add some things of your own, the big question is, how do we become wise? Well, for me, one of the, the great insights into this is from the poet, the Greek poet Aeschylus, who, who was also a playwright. And 2,500 years ago, in his play Agamemnon, he penned these words that are so powerful, uh, they've become almost a life mantra for me. But Aeschylus wrote, he who learns must suffer. And even in our sleep, pain that cannot forget, falls drop by drop upon the heart and even in our own despite against our will comes wisdom to us by the awful grace of God. <laughs> so what Aeschylus, our dear friend, is saying here is he's suggesting that the only way wisdom comes to us is through our suffering. Now, you may disagree with me. I think he's on to something. I think it's when we go through suffering and survive that and can reflect back on it, that wisdom comes to us. The uh, wonderful Zen master, D.T. Suzuki, I think expands on Aeschylus's thought. Suzuki says that the more you suffer, the deeper grows your character. And with the deepening of your character, you read more penetratingly into the secrets of life. And all the great artists, all the great religious leaders, and all the great social reformers have come out of the intensest struggles, which they fought bravely, quite frequently in tears and with bleeding hearts. And he says, 
unless you eat your bread in sorrow, you cannot taste of real life. Now, there's two profound observations Suzuki is saying that help me understand Aeschylus even more. Suffering can enable us to live wisely. And the unique bread of suffering that it has to offer is it awakens us to real life, which I think is wisdom. Now, suffering doesn't automatically do this. Suffering can make us mean and bitter, but it can awaken us to real life. In fact, the biblical author of the letter to the Hebrews even agrees by stating that Jesus of Nazareth was made perfect through suffering. That's Hebrews 2, verse 10, chapter 2, verse 10. So how does suffering do this work, if it, if it does this? Well, I suggest it does this by shattering the illusions that you and I have either inherited or created uh, that make us think we're something that we're not, that we're better than we are, that we're smarter than we are, that we're kinder than we are. It just shatters that we're the center of the universe. It shatters all that. And it helps us to live in reality and to live wisely. Now, during my work, my career as a minister coming up on almost 50 years as a minister, uh, one of the things I've seen is that many of us have been influenced by the uh, theology, the theological word omnipresence, which is a big word that just means God's everywhere all the time. And the, one of the places that's found in the Bible is Psalm 139, where the psalmist says, where can I go from your spirit, O God? If, where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. But one of the things I've learned, one of the places where God does not exist is in our fantasies, in our illusions. Because in my fantasy, I am God. I am all powerful. I am all wise. And so God's not there. But when I wake up to reality, the fantasies are shot and I become wise. And I... So I'm suggesting is, is if we wake up to this reality, as we allow suffering to do its work in us and shatter the illusions we have, we might, we just might encounter the real God. So that's the work of awful grace. And awful grace is not something different than amazing grace. Amazing grace, where the, we experience that loving, absolute affirmation of the divine being, of how special and tender and precious we are to the creator. There, there are two sides of the same coin. And one of the things I've learned about grace is grace is not only amazing. It's not only awful. It can be annoying. Annoying because if grace is anything, it's personal, intimately personal. It, it comes in its own sweet time. I mean, all the screaming in the world will not get grace to come any quicker. I've tried. It just shows up. Yes, it is liberating. It, and yes, it gives birth to wisdom. But grace also requires change. Grace requires that I trust God's loving acceptance and quit acting like a frightened little child. Maybe Annie Lamott puts it most succinctly when she says, I don't understand the mystery of grace, only that it meets us where we are, but it doesn't leave us where it found us. So after all these years of trying to follow Jesus, of giving my, myself to spiritual work and study, am I wiser today? Well, I suppose that depends on who you ask. I, I imagine I have some dear friends that think now I'm just a flaming heretic and I have forsaken all reason and I'm heading to hell in a handbasket. And there's other friends of mine that think, oh, I have fully matured. Now I have a, a, a strong adult mature faith. Who's to say who's right? Well, only God. I don't. I think when all is said and done, maybe Justice Stuart Potter was most right when he says, when it comes to wisdom, well, I know it when I see it. So may you not only see and know some wisdom, may you grow in wisdom this day. Amen. At this point, it's time for the prayers of 
the people. And so these are the petitions and requests we bring before you this morning, O loving creator, as together now we will say the prayer that Jesus taught as followers from the New Zealand Book of Common Prayer as we say together. Eternal spirit, earth maker, pain bearer, life giver, source of all that is and that shall be, father and mother of us all, loving God in whom is heaven. The hallowing of your name echoes through the universe. The way of your justice be followed by the peoples of this world. Your heavenly will be done by all created beings. Your commonwealth of peace and freedom sustain our hope and come on earth. With the bread we need for today, feed us. And the hurts we absorb from one another, forgive us. In the times of temptation and test, strengthen us. And from trials too great to endure, spare us. From the grip of all that is evil, free us. For you reign in the glory of the power that is love now and forever. Amen. At this time, you can participate in the life of this faith community to help keep it vibrant by giving. And your giving helps not only this church continue its work, but it helps people, neighbors here in need when they come and, and bug TG at the church office for help. She would have resources and the folks here would have resources to help distribute to our neighbors in need. And so we ask that you would give as generously as you can and that you would give our council our wonderful church council wisdom on how to disperse these funds to help things grow not only here in ashland but in places far beyond in our final song i've got peace like a river and we are going to redo verse number one and we've done before we got So here's a benediction for us. Here's a final thought. I'll let the final thought go to uh, Howard Thurman, wonderful civil rights leader. He was a mentor to Martin Luther King. He was, uh, Howard Thurman was a friend of Martin King's dad, Martin Luther King Sr. And so these are some words from Howard Thurman. There is something in every one of you that waits and listens for the sound of the genuine in yourself. 
it is the only true guide you will ever have. And if you cannot hear it, you will all of your life spend your days on the ends of strings that somebody else pulls. And so may you come into contact and may you hear that inner guide to lead you on your journey of life. Blessings. Amen.